But I have a theory that, you know, we want to deal with um, poverty and racism and all these things, but to do it the right way, to change the structures, we do need policy change. Mm -hmm. And yet the people in a position to do policy change are already advantaged in a way, privileged. And so I feel like it's really important to work with building the awareness and capacity for attunement and care in those populations and starting from early childhood so that we can become the people that as an instinct want to care for one another. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. In his conversations with visionaries, innovators, artists, and healers, Thomas invites guests into a relational experience that allows inspiration and innovation to emerge. This is The Point of Relation. Our guest for today's episode is Christina Bethel. Dr. Christina Bethel is an internationally recognized change agent and professor at John Hopkins University, working to promote a just and thriving society by restoring our relational and social roots of well-being. Advancing a We Are the Medicine framework, Christina's research and publications have sparked an international focus on promoting positive childhood experiences to prevent and heal childhood, community, and intergenerational trauma and the syndemic of adverse childhood experiences we face today. So welcome to The Point of Relation. My name is Thomas Hubel, and I'm sitting here with Christina, Christina Bethel. So much welcome, very warm welcome, Christina. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Mm, we have a long-term friendship. We know each other already for a long time, and we had many of these conversations already. And mm -hmm. I know every time I walk away, first it's nourishing that we meet and our friendship gets deeper. And also I'm simply amazed by the science data you come up with, by the relational health. And yeah, I know you worked a lot on ACEs and PACEs and <laughs> so many, so many parts that really resonate deeply with me. And so we share a lot of passion together so i'm really excited that we have this conversation here on my podcast me too i remember meeting you and thinking oh my goodness um like somebody who i can talk to who i can relate <laughs> to and also you were talking about the marketplace which is so much of what my journey has been is bringing it into very concrete forms in the world mm. yeah. That's right. So maybe we start, you know, I mean, you know, and, and many of the listeners know, so we, you know, we explore a lot of how to heal collective trauma, how to create mm -hmm. relational health, how to have attuned relationships that help us to flourish. Maybe you can speak a little bit to what's, what are you working on that you would consider your leading edge at the moment? So what's, what's mm -hmm. new for you or what's, what's exciting for you? And then yeah. we, we dive in. Well, one thing that's exciting is the sort of accumulation of studies and, and mindsets and cultural shifts that are allowing us to really have a very explicit conversation about relational health as a, as a solution. And so we've been talking about toxic stress and trauma, and we worked with the American Academy of Pediatrics and my colleague, Andy Gardner, who you spoke with, who led the policy statement shifting the dialogue from toxic stress is the problem to relational health is the solution. Mm -hmm. And of course, you run into the toxic stress and the trauma, but inside the container of the intention to create an attuned safe space for that, which then ends up being the healing force. And so we get to talk about it. And now it's a, we're bringing it in at a national level as well. So we'd already gotten some play with Congress and senators, and now there's lots of funding streams. So all of a sudden there's a lot happening. Um, but it's very important that we not forget what we're trying to actually do is create those safe, stable, nurturing relationships with ourselves, with each other, with life. And that that's actually something we're built for, but we often, it went offline and we have to build skills. And so a lot of what you talk about the embodiment of the capacity to connect, to be seen and to see and is a deep learning. So it's definitely really exciting right now. I'm working on a National Academies of Science um, committee on improving child and youth well-being through children's healthcare system transformation. 
and the centerpiece of all of it is addressing, you know, uh, what we're talking about. And relationships are like the first principle. And also that flourishing and well-being isn't the absence of illness. It's the live of the living and relating self. So life involves difficulty and adversity. And we are the descendants of people who've gotten through some of that horrible adversity. So we're built for that. And how do we focus on building that capacity so that we can turn toward the trauma and not just re-traumatize? So I'm going to stop because there's so many other things, but I wanted to mention that there's actually a National Academy of Sciences Committee that's coming out with a big report to help guide the nation here. Um, and there's things going on globally too with this work. So I can talk about more of that in a minute, but very exciting. Yeah, so maybe talk a little bit more about what's going on globally. I think that's because we need to. Yeah. Um, so I think you probably know that a few years ago, we created something called the Positive Childhood Experiences Scale. And, you know, what I've always noticed is that there's similar levels of adverse childhood experiences and very different outcomes, depending on other factors. And what we've had to show population-based, even though you and I know it's true, you still have to study it and show it to get action or attention anywhere, is that the quality of the relationships between parents and children, teachers and children, and communities really impact and are the major things that are leading to whether children do better or not better given similar levels of adversity and that it goes into adulthood. So similar to ACEs playing out, getting under your skin and playing out over your life, positive experiences do too, mm -hmm. except for there's this paradox where when we look at what is a positive childhood experience, it's how we're met when things are hard. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's divorced from adversity. But it's how we are with each other and whether we feel safe to talk about our feelings and, you know, build, create a sense of support for one another that are extremely effective all the way through to adulthood, just like ACEs are. So, and it's a dual continuum. It's not like you only have positive if you don't have negative or you only have, you know, they're not like this, they're operating similarly. So we should always be encouraged. And what we noticed after the paper came out in JAMA is that it was being taken up all over the world. Like, you know, how you can look at the, like where it actually is. And I think it's in every country, except for not so much in Russia, um, but everywhere else. And in particular, like in Africa, they're making posters of these positive childhood experiences in communities and in Mexico and in Spain and Italy. And we've been talking to the Scottish parliament about, you know, instead of focusing on getting rid of ACEs, focus on promoting capacities for relational health and you run into ACEs. But if you go straight at it without a sense of safety, a safety container and a sense that, you know, healing, you are whole already. You know, it's not like there's something wrong with you, that it doesn't really seem to work. So it's very exciting. And for some reason, that really resonated with people that they felt like they weren't powerless. But the things that the positive experiences point to is building that capacity to connect in the attuned way, the felt sense way, like my body and my brain and your brain and body don't lie to each other. And we're built for that. And that's really what I think people are resonating with is, is that. And, and of course, there's a lot of, it's very intricate, as you know, like, what does, what is the anatomy of an authentic connection? And what do you do when somebody's lost the desire to connect? You know, how do you work with teams who are shut down already? So it's a lot of things like that, but it has definitely been a part of both policy and public health strategy now in the, in the, in the globe. <laughs> which is really great. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's amazing. And that's also very hopeful. I mean, that's yeah. but and I'm not a part of it. Like they just send it to me. They're like, okay, here, we're posting these. Thank you for your work. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, so it's being taken mm -hmm. up in, in organically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and so tell me how, because maybe many of the listeners would say, yes, that makes intellectually makes a lot of sense. But, uh, you know, when we get triggered, when we already okay. shut down, when we're already distant, how, how do we in communities create relational health in, okay. in your view? And what are the things that really work? What are the maybe not to do's? And what are the to do's? Uh, mm-hmm. We improve and upgrade relational health in communities. In ourselves, community. Yeah, I mean, obviously you're the master here in this, but the first thing I would say is to be aware of what's happening and bringing present what's absent or we tend to like to push away, that that's where the life comes in, is to be aware in groups and in communities about sort of the felt sense of the coherence of the relational field and that can be trained and people like know it. I definitely do these polls and groups about these things and they know where things are at. And it's when we tell the truth about what's hard often that we get the life force come up. And then that ends up being like a positive experience, but it's through the portal of being authentic about what's challenging. And so the vulnerability is really needed. And so, of course, all the processes from theory you come into play and many of the community-based um, healing strategies are all about creating that capacity to feel and not miss an opportunity to maintain that coherence. Even if it, you think you're going backwards and wasting time, like in a meeting, if you override the fact that people have shut down because something happened or what have you, you're not actually moving forward. You're kind of, you're doing something, but you're not necessarily moving with the group coherence and possibility for what might emerge creatively. And so I think those are skills that are really um, important. And how do you apply them in a work context or a policy context or in the room with a patient? You know, because we often think these kind of things only happen inside of intimate relationships, but we need, you know, really uh, many of the connections that people talk about when we've done the research on positive childhood experiences and a sense of belonging and how you got through a hard time. And somebody will say, well, you know, I was really down. And then I walked into this 7-Eleven and the clerk looked at me like I existed. And I realized no one had ever really seen me or maybe I never really showed myself to anyone because I hadn't gotten that broken open. And then all of a sudden something happened good for them. So I think we all like the bus driver, the delivery person, the grocery clerk, everybody has superpower. And in our studies, it's not always what happens in the family, it's the school and the community and things like that. And it's also very empowering because it says it's not only about professionals, it's about everybody. It's kind of a collective mm-hmm. competence that we can acquire mm-hmm. that we are all part of. So that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. So you spoke about patients. Maybe we can speak a little bit in childhood healthcare and healthcare in general. Yeah. I mean, the, our healthcare system is a lot of, there's a lot of stress. It's full of stress and toxic stress. People get sick, people get suicidal, people go to drug abuse. Mm-hmm. And um and a lot has to do with the systemic stress, being exposed right. to trauma, to difficult life circumstances, to disease all the time. So how how would you say we can, how can that transform our healthcare system into a much more resilient uh, and supportive mm-hmm. network? Yeah. You can speak to that a bit. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so I mentioned the National Academy of Science Committee that is working on um, a proposal for children, children and youth in the healthcare system to create well-being in the context of this known stress and high rates of mental health problems and things like that. Um, and you know, the the nickname we have for it is creating relational systems of care. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you think that you know, I as a provider, a professional, am here to help you as a youth with, you know stress and toxic stress and mental health issues. And the only way to help you is to partner with you because it's co-produced. It's not like I can just give you something, you know, pin you down and give you a drug and somehow that you're going to get better. So all health and well-being is co-produced. So the glue is the relationship and the trusting relationship. 
that you can't hide from. And so who we are as professionals and how we engage makes such a difference. And the studies are really clear that when youth or children feel they're close or cared about, then it opens the door for um, being able to, first of all, share that something is hard and to create the pathways of awareness that, you know, there's something deeper that's true about us that isn't just the trauma. And that's where the positive pieces come in to build a sense of meaning and purpose and will to stay engaged and related and reach out for help. And so I think that in healthcare, creating these, um, what I call personalized connected encounters is what we're trying to do. And that's what the AAP is trying to do. So part of that though, is not using the visit time to collect data and check boxes and be disease oriented, but really get that information through using digital health apps, which we create to help safely engage youth in self-reflection, picking what they care about. And then when they're met in a clinical setting, you're responding to what they've said they are interested in. So the engagement is there. And then you pull the thread of what they're interested in, no matter what it is, And then I think all roads lead to Rome that eventually that creates the relational trust pathway to then go deeper into what the opportunity might be to meet that youth into a place of their own healing. And so that attunement of the provider to that process is going to vary a lot, right? Because not everybody, Mm -hmm. but it's still, I think if you even intend it and you're on the pathway, it's like a superpower. It seems mm-hmm. to me like you don't, we have to say this to parents, teachers, providers, we don't have to be perfect, but we do have to be intentional. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So there are two questions coming up. One is about the skill building of healthcare mm-hmm. professionals, because as you said, there is a, a relating is not just a given, it's something that we usually, I mean, some of us grow up in a way that that stays in, attuned and intact. But for some of us, it gets really hurt also. So we are less related, even if you're intentional. So how do we upgrade the skill set? And how do we counter a little bit the force in the healthcare system that everything we can make shorter and cheaper is better? Right. So because relating needs its time, it needs its resonance, even if it doesn't need a lot of time, it needs quality, maybe quality okay. relationships. Okay. But still, there is something we could say, oh, why do we, if we can collect the data, so let's make the meeting shorter. And okay. we can, so how do we counter that movement and say, listen, relationships are one uh, incredibly important element of a healing process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I can tell you is that it is top of the agenda declared by almost every healthcare body at this point. Now, whether it's being operationalized or not, I think that's where we have to really be persistent, but at least it's stated Mm -hmm. that this is what needs to happen. And basically we have a term called relational health workers so that every patient, every person, every young person or family has somebody that they can go deeper with. And it may not be the doctor, it may be a family specialist, but that relationship is the key. And Mm -hmm. so that's one good thing. And I know in our work with pediatricians and doing well visits, which are like 15 of them in the first few years of life, and they're meant to promote relational health is one of, is their top goal is to Mm -hmm. promote, you know, family connections that are healthy attachments and dealing with all that. I don't think we're going to try to shrink the time, but we can optimize it by not using it to do administrative tasks Mm -hmm. and then to grow it. And often this is where research comes in. Sadly, like we have to actually show that when we extend the visit, that over time, they can, they don't all have to be that long, but if you don't create a base or a foundation, especially in the beginning of trust, and connection, which can take time, it'll take different amounts of time with different people, then we don't get the benefits. And so that's part of where the research pieces come in is to show it badly. I mean, you think not, but in, and it's showing that, that when we can really engage patients, when there's a sense of trust and being heard, 
and all of those things that goes better. So then the question is, how do we build those skills? And it's, I think the biggest challenge is people who think they have those skills because they're thinking transactionally. They're like, I did the thing I was supposed to do. I checked the boxes I related. And, and to really have a lived experience, I think is probably the most important thing. If we could replicate what you do in hundreds of millions of places where people have the lived experience so they, because it's natural to, to feel when am I actually connected and when am I not? And once you, you feel the difference through role-playing, through the triad work like that you do, then I think it just sparks something and awakens something. So that becomes your bar with your patients or with those you're caring for. And then you start to realize that you want to go from fixing to connecting. That if you're not connected, there's not a lot happening. Now, I'm not saying like if you have a broken leg and it's an emergency, but even in that context, you it's not like you go offline in your capacity to connect because there's something urgent in front of you. And we have all these myths, you know, that if it's urgent and really important, I don't have time for connection. Exactly. You know, connection is that thing that's a luxury. And mm. that's not actually, you know, we, we actually have the capacity to bring attunement into all situations in a microscopic way. And it's really that sort of microscopic attunement that also mirrors what's happening in our body, right? Like our cells are, are dividing and combining. And it's almost like the more intimate we are with our own bodies and processes, then we can start to move with that, which I think brings us into a place to connect, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. We call it biobehavioral synchrony, mm -hmm. inter interception. There's all these like science words, but it's basically, you know, attunement. And I do think breaking it down so that it's really clear, like I talk about the anatomy of a connection, you know, and what it actually feels like in you and the other and how you can see it. And how you can hold it, even if it seems like the other isn't connecting. You know, there's all these really important scenarios where I think a lot of providers think, well, I did what I could. I, I said the words and it's up to them now instead of, you know, staying connected. So we try to get this included in things like ACGME requirements for training. Mm -hmm. So there's deep training in medical school and in um, social work and mental health to really build these relational skills. And some medical schools are really going deeply with that, some aren't, but it's moving its way up into the accrediting organization, the training organization, and then also into performance measurement. I know that sounds crazy, but how do you measure whether there was a sense of safety and trust and connection? And so that's part of what what this, you know, national report is going to do is talk about what are the measures, what are the training, what do we need to do with how we finance so that we don't put doctors in a position to have to just do more and more patients fast. So they actually can spend more time with one person and less with another, but still get paid. <laughs> okay. You know, we don't put the financial incentives in a place where there's all this moral injury because I can't be with, because I feel like I'm on a hamster wheel. We really think we have to fix in the system. Exactly. That's uh, that was also one of the part of my question is how do we create a financial mm -hmm. space that that can really flourish and that we don't need to be in this hamster wheel, but mm -hmm. we can actually have to take the time if it's needed. It will be different from patient to patient. But yeah, then, I mean, the, go ahead. The more we base it on outcomes and experience, and not on the time you spent, that the thing that the good thing that happened. And so outcomes-based measurement um, is a key thing because, you know, I used to always say, if you can get somebody healthy by having them stand on their head, good for you. <laughs> you know, what do you, it may be different, but, you know, where we get away from the me mechanistic measurement and into outcomes that can free people up. So the financing has been a big part of my career is how do we, what I call free or brilliant, so that we are, are the incentives are aligned with our capacity to then, you know, be co-creative and, and do what's needed for each person rather than, you know, the hamster mm -hmm. wheel. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think two things I want to pick up on. One is that you said when it's urgent, there's no time for it. And that especially when it's urgent and people, I mean, I saw this when I worked as a paramedic many years ago, like if you need, especially when people are in this deep shock and when people are in this kind of like life-threatening phase, like somebody being there, and even if it's just a few minutes and being attuned while people get treatments, I think is a very important actually mm -hmm. skill to have. And that mm -hmm. especially if you work with emergencies to be there and be present with the person really helps mm -hmm. to reduce and i'm sure Absolutely. you have data for this that it uh, released yeah, it decreases mm -hmm. the ptsd afterwards mm -hmm. it does i mean you know there's a actually the harvard mastery of stress study started in 1951 and they looked at some freshmen and they did it. it's a 35 year follow-up that happened and they asked them about their experiences of being cared about by their family and others. And then they randomized them and they basically followed up. And those that did not report feeling that, having those experiences, which often happen in the middle of stress, it's like that, that positivity paradox that the most positive experience is how I was met when I was in a crisis. Mm -hmm. Like that is the positive, that is what lodges also in baby's attachment when I'm when I have a stumble and then you're there for me after, like the attachment molecules go great there. And so it's in the falling down that we learn to walk, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, basically they found that 87% that didn't have those embodied memories of care, which we know is especially when things are hard, had 87% had pretty serious health problems 35 years later. But 25% for those that had both parents and felt like they were supported and cared about. And this is from 1951 to, you know, 86. And the study was reported in the early 90s, but it's, it's you know, it's well regarded. And there's other studies like that, too. So we, we think, oh, well, because it's a human, the, what we call, I think of as the inner and relational pharmacy, mm -hmm. not the... Not the you know, pharmacy, pharmacy, that it's not important. But, you know, it's, we, we really are the medicine. And I think that people don't realize they're super, how important they are in that way. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I wanted to make sure I shared that with you, but can you go further? Because I want to follow your I think you were headed towards yeah, no this was perfect this was perfect because it also shows you know people can look this up and can see the studies and so i think the data is also important and then i want to say like first i think that that has a big impact on how people heal how people i know mm -hmm. deal with their trauma later mm -hmm. and then and then uh, i was going to ask you also about okay so if you see now like it, like how we can train because we all know that we're I'm hurt or traumatized. It's very hard for me to be related to you. So and when let's say trauma is not so much less in the healthcare system. So when we say how do we create training programs like on a larger scale? Maybe there is already a lot happening. So how do healthcare professionals or people that work in mental health or as I said, social workers, like how can we train those skills so that we create a resilient network and yeah. maybe in pediatrics how can we create a physician child parent or healthcare workers child parent network so that those relational ecosystems start to become the Nice. Health, you know, health is an ecosystemic effect. And right. You work right. a lot around that. So maybe you can speak a little bit to that. Yeah. I mean, so if you're going to be a surgeon, you're supervised by all these other surgeons and they give you feedback and they watch you do the surgery and all these things. We need something similar mm -hmm. for creating that container of care and attunement. And that, of course, can mean fostering it in the people who are training. Mm -hmm. And of course, the organizations, and I'm in an organization, a big university that I don't think has, not, I mean, I think we talk about it, but is it built into the structures and how things are done and the time that's given? So I think we really do have to get, and it is growing, getting to a point where we really have, you know, there's 
see uh, continuing medical education requirements. And that we, when we started making pain management, a required training, like you couldn't get your recertification or licensing renewed unless you did at least a certain amount of hours around pain management. And of course, mindfulness started getting in on pain management and it created a whole like opportunity for bringing some of these things in because pain is actually very affected by mindfulness practice and yoga and also healthy relationships. So I think we need to keep getting it in as a required training. And sometimes, you know, I think most of the time, and this certainly was true with me, even though since I was a child, I was attuned to the inner connection and all these things. There was some part of me that didn't really attune as much to the relational part because it wasn't really obvious to me that there was another that could actually be a part of my attunement because it was kind of me and me at the moment for a while in my childhood. It's like an awareness that happens in your body through practice. And then all of a sudden you feel it differently. We do need the deep dives. And so having it be part of the environment of the training program with deep dive opportunities that really take the time for a person to, you know, in mindfulness practice, they say, you know, seven days straight at the beginning, just like do it deeply. And then we learn it. So I, I do think that's where we're headed. Um, and it's more and more. But one of the questions I've always had with you is how do we scale this so that we don't just pass it off as, you know, learning how to have difficult conversations because they're still from the head and they're transactional. Mm-hmm. You know, so, but that building that in again to training expectations, performance measures with opportunities um, is really what's key. And I think nowadays, at least I have great experiences with that online online spaces mm-hmm. can be very attuned and can we can train also mm-hmm. a lot of attunement skills online, even if at first people maybe might need to kind of open their minds to that. But I think there's a lot that can be done in order to scale uh, the training uh, that not everybody, everything needs to be in person. It's some, you know, there's a good mix, yeah. but I think yeah. there's, there's a great uh, opportunity also in, in the reach. Mm-hmm. Uh, through online medium Mm -hmm. and um so so okay so that's that's for the healthcare system how how do we look at you know when we and i am sure you have a lot of data about this that when communities different communities are more uh traumatized so that Mm -hmm. that relational fabric might be more hurt and there might be more side effects so how do we bring this into communities that really need it so when uh, maybe also the financial means or the yeah. is not so high, so how can we how can we we all of us be part of whatever taking responsibility that yeah. that we bring it to the places that really need it yeah. and um, and how can we support it and what's happening yeah. already? Yeah, well, this is this is really my or my heart is I I just got done doing a lot of work with Mississippi, which was the lowest the most high need, low income state in the country with the highest rates of all problems you could imagine. And Congress dedicated $17.5 million for them to create a framework that could be scaled nationally as a model to really address what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And so I helped this, I facilitated the creation of what we call the engagement and action framework, which is a hologram of we're trying to create healthy engagement and, and the relation with children and their parents, which relies on the parents and their community and the community and the larger structures and the policies that flow down and impact that. And the disparities in resources between some communities and another, and then the rates of school readiness or school engagement or high school graduation or crime are just really mirrored right up the the way. So basically, the frameworks that are being used to transform systems across sectors between healthcare, school, social work, businesses, juvenile justice, and all of that are um, framed in terms of creating connections among them where they start to model and, you know, move out of their fear. So that's where we started is how can I get these agency people to realize that if they empower this one, that doesn't mean they're getting something taken away. And then hit stay the course with the importance of creating um, 
the relational spaces, which you can, there's a lot of variation in how communities do with similar levels of adversity based on a lot of factors that don't require legislative change. However, we need policies like there wasn't postpartum depression coverage in Mississippi. Well, there is now. Mm -hmm. And that was a big deal to mm -hmm. get that, that passed. And so it was a lot of advocacy and data bringing and really educating legislators. And so to optimize capacities without having to change all the uh, Uber structures and policies is possible while we work on those structures and policies. And that's where I think we have the biggest challenge. But I have a theory that, you know, we want to deal with um, poverty and racism and all these things, but to do it the right way to change the structures, we do need policy change. Mm -hmm. And yet the people in a position to do policy change are already advantaged in a way, privileged. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's really important to work with building the awareness and capacity for attunement and care in those populations and starting from early childhood so that we can become the people that as an instinct want to care for one another, mm -hmm. which I think is what, you know, the studies that have been done on putting kids on an island and they don't try to kill each other. They end up wanting to support and love each other. And then I think we were built for that. So it's very hard. I have to say, I'm going to Arkansas tomorrow and Tennessee and a lot of these Southern states that have policies that, you know, can kind of make you gasp, but they're real places. And, you know, there's a lot they can do without policy change that really builds on the relationships they have and then creating strong advocacy that combines data with advocacy to really push the policy changes. So, you know, I can share a lot more with you about the framework, but it's very intricate. What are the roles and responsibilities of all the sectors? But the simple rules, if you're a complex system change, is based on simple rules. Like you can't actually follow somebody around and tell them what to do every minute. They have to have an internalized sense of how do we do things around here. And so in this framework, one of the simple rules is that everyone owns their power as a leader. No matter where you are, everyone has power within and between themselves and each other to heal, to support, to be a healing presence with every child and family they come in contact with. And through any door, whether it doesn't matter where you are, like we talked about, it could be early care and education or healthcare or, you know, in a community center that through every door and that we make sure that when we're working with people, there's no broken link. So we don't just let people leave our presence without bridging, you know, to, an to another, which means we're related to that other group. Okay. And then finally, to get feedback loops. So, you know, when we do mindfulness and we, we reflect, we get feedback. And so having a practice of how's it going? How's it going? And so that's where some of the data and reflective processes come in. So there's just these simple rules that can help organize everybody from disparate, different parts of the community around what we're up to. And then it can be churches that are leading or it can be the school that's leading, but everyone is a part of it. I know this sounds vague because it's, it's hard to talk about this in detail when we're in a short call, but the idea that there's a framework for systems change in a statewide that's being scaled nationally called engagement in action. Mm -hmm. That is what's centered, is the engagement, which is defined relationally in, in many of the ways that you talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, no, to me, it doesn't sound vague at all. I mean, I know it's much more complex than what you can share in such a short time, but it gives mm -hmm. us like a bit of a feeling. I like also that everybody's a leader, there's empowerment, everybody's mm -hmm. happiness is being invited into a relational mm -hmm. network. So this all sounds very concrete to me and not yeah, vague at all and very healthy. I think that mm -hmm. when I listen to you, I get a feeling of, ah, this sounds good and it feels yeah. good. But it feels like organic and it yeah. feels right. It's really exciting because, you know, our health systems in America anyway are held accountable based on something called the high reliability organizations model. The Joint Commission, if you're going to open the door for a clinic or a lab or anything, you have to be accredited. And so they use the high reliability organizations model, which is really the study of how systems optimize performance. And the core skill is what's called collective mindfulness. <laughs> That's it. And so how do we collectively become situationally aware of what's happening? 
Mm-hmm. How do we um, basically be more curious in the fray than to get feedback, to be aware in a moment by moment way about how things are going to the deference to expertise is one of them. And I think that's one of the most important things is we respect each other that in surgery centers, sometimes it's literally the person cleaning the floors that notices the problems that are leading that if they didn't find them would lead to a problem in the surgery. And so just to really create these, so there's a lot more in place, if you will, but we need to back it up with training and financially align, financial alignment, and in many ways, activating people like the public, patients, families, to be aware of their own power and possibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think that, you know, when we look at our data, which took like decades, as you know, to create these measures and get them into surveys in a population way so we could even study it. But we ask about family resilience and whether families are feeling hopeful, whether they feel they have any strength to draw on, whether they turn to each other when they're having problems to work out their problems, or do mm-hmm. they isolate, and whether they reach out to others. And less than half of children in the country right now live in homes where families report those things. And this is on a survey where it's a positive report. Like they're going to say it's true. It's a positivity bias. So at less than half, it's probably worse than that. And so what we also then know is if those families are working with professionals that really listen to them, and they feel they can trust their resilience, the family resilience, sense of hope, strength, possibility to get help goes up, which is a straight shot to the resilience of the child and the sense of the child feeling safe, which is a straight shot to school readiness and school engagement and relational health when they're an adult, which is what the whole trajectory of our research has shown is it lasts all the way through life, where as an adult, you are more likely to have social emotional uh, connection less, way less depression. If as a child, you had these positive experiences that are relational, Mm. that depend on the family, that also depend on how they're met by the professionals in the community with that family. So that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's the line where we're drawing, um, you know, so I think it's been drawn. So then my question is, okay, what do we do now? Continuing to translate it into concrete things that for me, an interest is really going deep with what you're talking about, which is how do we really operationalize the training? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And exactly. start, yeah. Exactly. And mm-hmm. I, have, I have one more question that relates also to the training, because as we both know that the, when I look at, at the systemic trauma in either an organization, society, wherever, mm-hmm. it's inverse information so it's kind of it's it's the unconsciousness the non-arising of data or right. information or perception so every system because you said before collective mindfulness mm-hmm. which i think is very powerful and and, and essential mm-hmm. and at the same time how do we support systems to become aware of what the system doesn't see because every system has its own unconscious dimension that it can't it can't perceive, and I'm wondering how we systemically work on individual and collective, you know, uh, opening so that that the the collective dimension of shared unconscious spaces can can grow. And uh, I mean, just any thoughts you have about this? Yeah, I mean. If you look at, so the, we have a lot of models on quality improvement, um, and the core of it is to drive out fear. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you can't improve if you're too afraid that if you notice something that might not be working, you're going to get in trouble. Mm-hmm. And so one thing is to create a culture of curiosity and where we all know we have strengths and weaknesses and can be it's okay to talk about what's not working without being threatened for your job, which I think is still a huge issue Mm because everybody's blind. And often when people have problems, if there's a systemic factor, right? So if I'm struggling, there's a larger, you know, university structure I'm in and societal structure I'm in that may be impacting that. So the first is to drive out fear and to just always assume that there's, you know, we need each other in these reflections and 
ways of purposeful reflection and measurement to give feedback. So, you know, in some of our work, like it seems really simple, but, you know, we were working on maternal depression screening and the importance of that. And it wasn't happening at all when we started our work. And we interviewed lots of doctors and we couldn't get it, you know, get acceptance to do this as a routine thing because doctors thought, well, I know when a mom is depressed. So I only screen the people that I'm pretty sure are. So we did a study and we looked independently at maternal depression rates. And then we looked at whether they were screened or not. And it was a 50-50 chance that the providers felt like who they needed to screen. And when they saw that data, it was, we were actually working in Kaiser Permanente at the time. They just changed overnight. They were like, oh my God, I am blind. I thought I could see. And this data showed me that it was like flipping a coin, whether I was right. And so this is the interplay of the culture creating a safety and almost like an excited curiosity, what I call take on transparency, to be more curious than afraid to get feedback. And then there's always someone who's doing better than me and somebody who's doing worse and I can teach them and they can teach me. And so creating a culture of continuous presencing of what's absent. Knowing that it's there, I think is really key, but it is actually already built into the good models of quality improvement, but the system has to match it. Like, so the payment and the, if something doesn't go right, um, and then it's tended to, it can't always be a, a process of being reprimanded, mm-hmm. but supported. And I think that's often what's missing mm-hmm. across the board, but it is really happening in a lot of places. I just don't think it's fast enough, but that's my issue with life. You know, I have to let go of, you know, the speed at which things, how, mm-hmm. how do I know what the speed is? <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And how it works. But, mm-hmm. but I think those are a drive out fear, make a safe place to make things up, um, present that are absent and measurement really does help. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds great. Also like how you described the, how the mm-hmm. data showed that we need to do something new. Mm-hmm. And- so we have a tool that's an online tool. You can just send to your patients every now and then where they give you feedback, but it's blinded. And then after 25 complete it, you give an aggregate report as a provider. And mm-hmm. so you get to stay in touch with your own patients and they love it. They're like, Oh, Okay, I thought that look what I, that actually went better than I thought. This is something, and then there's a whole motivation when you know it's your patient. It's not some like inanimate administrative data record, but you're actually giving mm-hmm. communities and patients and families a chance to share with you. And it turns out that that's very energizing for providers to get information from their families, mm-hmm. and and so we make it really easy for them to do that and safe because they control it. And it's still confidential. Those are just mm-hmm. like example strategies we can use. Yeah, yeah, that sounds amazing. Also to mm-hmm. improve the systemic intelligence flow. So this sounds amazing. Exactly. I mean, and it's like Europe, you know, I mean, we need these kinds of things to create mm-hmm. a sense of group knowledge. Right. Right. Yeah. So, Christina, I see our time. Every time we talk, it kind of flies by. It's amazing. <laughs> I was so much with you, and it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I and I resonate with so many things you're saying. And I think we're so mm-hmm. much on a wavelength here. Maybe mm-hmm. just to finish, is there anything that you would like our listeners, I don't know, to take away from this? Any kind of summary or things that you think are important? I mean, I think one thing is that. There's a lot of good happening, but we really need people to be activated and that, you know, to not, I I feel like some people are kind of dropping out of the structures of our society because they seem just too much, but we make a difference and getting activated and speaking truth, it makes a difference, especially if we can combine it with some kind of science or data that combines integration, it really does help and change the world and to be hopeful because there's pockets of possibility like your pocket project everywhere and to just work to be that in whatever way Mm -hmm. and then inspire everyone else because i think we just really have to be at the watch of you know the level of hopelessness that can otherwise arise when we start to see the trauma bubble up to the top like it is right now Mm -hmm. but most of your listeners already know that (laughs) 
Right. And still it's good to hear it over and over again. Yeah. And, uh, and people get your enthusiasm and your motivation. And, and to support each other. Because I have to tell you, it's really hard out there. And I don't, I can't look to the people necessarily that I'm working with directly for that support. So we really need each other. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very lovely that you're here. Yeah. And I yeah. feel we are working together somehow. Yeah, me too. Uh, it's lovely. Yeah. And so thank you very much, Christina. I think this was a very rich ride. I would like, maybe we can do a part two soon. It would be lovely. Yeah. Another update. <laughs> Another update, right. And uh, so thank you and uh, bless your work. And I thank love you. that you're doing this. It supports very much what we all do. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. And you support me in every way. I don't miss anything. I can. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're invited to attend a free online event featuring in-depth interviews, poetry readings, movement sessions, guided meditations, and panel discussions delving into a theme of creating a global healing movement. The Collective Trauma Summit is an online gathering of artists, activists, scientists, and visionaries convened by Thomas Hubel to explore the effects of trauma in our society and to inspire a collective healing movement. Go to collectivetraumasummit.com to register for the free event, which starts September 26th. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support. <laughs>